everyone and welcome to ABN and the Trinity channel. I am Jacob Caspo and we are very excited today to have you joining us for two live debates related to this season of Christmas that we are currently in. Thank you for joining us. For our first debate today, we will, this was our second debate actually, and it is, we're speaking about the prophecies uh, foretelling the first coming of the Messiah. We have two guests with us today to help us try clarify this event. On my left, we have Osama Abdullah. Nice to see you. He is the webmaster of uh, www.answering-christianity.com. He has established his website since 1999, and he has debated several renowned apologists in the past. He also has a master's degree in computer science Welcome, Osama. Thank you, Brother Jacob. Thank and you. his opponent on my right hand is Dr. David Cashin. He is the professor of intercultural studies at Columbia Biblical Seminary and School of Ministry. Dr. Cashin optioned his Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Gordon College and his Master of Art and Doctrine of Philosophy in Indology from Stockholm. University, Stockholm, Sweden. While in Sweden, Dr. Cashin served as a pastor of two churches. He wrote and taught courses and seminars in Islamic history, theology, and Muslim-Christian relationship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cashin. Welcome, doctor. Okay, gentlemen, and uh, it is a pleasure to have both of you, Thank you to join us today. Before we start, I would like to set some guidelines for this debate. We want to make sure each debater has an equal amount of time to state their cases, provided to the evidence to help the evidence to help discuss this subject. There will be three rounds in today's, actually will be four rounds debate, with a couple of rounds of crossfire followed by time afterward to make questions from our callers. But unfortunately today we're not going to have that because of technical difficulty. And I want to encourage you guys to help ABN because uh, it is a time of giving and I'm hoping that we help the station to stay on the air and can we can go over these technical difficulties. Uh, we're going to start first of all, the opening statement will be 13 minutes and uh, I will give each one a five minute, a two minute, a one minute. Uh, telling them that they need to be uh, to know their, the time when to stop. Uh, I will start right now. The first one we started with was, uh, Brother Osama, uh, Dr. Uh, David. It will be your first 13 minute, and I'd like to set my mic my clock. And we are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, let's. Well, thank you so much, and it's a real pleasure to be on the ABN Network and to have the opportunity to share with uh, friends across the globe uh, through this medium of television. Uh, today, our uh, topic for debate is the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the coming of Messiah Jesus, and it's really a pleasure to talk on that subject with you and also with my good friend, Mr. Osama Abdullah. We're just delighted to have this time uh, with you. Uh, I also have a website that I recommend, and I'd like to at least mention that right at the start. It's called AnsweringIslam.com, uh, and you will hear many arguments uh, from my good friend, uh, which will be found also at his website, and you can also go to the website AnsweringIslam.com and hear counter-arguments to that as you seek out the truth. And my desire is that you will find the truth, for as Jesus said, the truth will set you free. Our topic, again, is prophecies in the Old Testament. So let me begin, and I'm going to be spending most of my discussion in the Scriptures, what the Bible says uh, about the coming of Jesus. So we'll be almost exclusively in the Old Testament, but from time to time I may uh, note some of the ways in which these prophecies were fulfilled in the New Testament. Let me begin with the book of Micah, uh, chapter 5 and verse 2. Uh, you know that Amongst the Jewish people, there has been throughout their history a tremendous expectation and desire and longing for Messiah. Why do they long for this? Well, 
Allah has given them the law. They have the law, the Torah, full of different laws on how to be pleasing to God. But every Jew, as well as every Christian, and I think every Muslim, would confess that they are unable to keep the law. Uh, law is not bad, it's good. It tells us about the holiness and righteousness of God, but law cannot save us. And so throughout the Bible, there is this longing expressed for the coming of Messiah. Sometimes it's kind of implicit in the text, sometimes it's explicit. But the Old Testament text gives us many signs for who this Savior would be who would lead his people through the self in order that they might become forever children of God in intimacy and relationship with God. So, for instance, uh, the scriptures tell us the place of Jesus' birth. Uh, in the uh, book of uh, Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2, we find the following statement. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, I'm sure my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Osama, will uh, mention about, well, origins. Does Jesus have an origin? Well, that must mean he's not God. Uh, or he might say something about this, that, uh, you know, uh, this is just someone who's a ruler. Well, keep in mind that the Bible has hundreds of these kind of prophecies, more than 700. So I'm not going to have time to cover all of those or even the 42 that have to do with his death and resurrection. I'm just going to be selecting certain parts. And the way you understand this is by looking at the totality of all of these stories and what they indicate. So what this tells us is that Messiah, who is coming to save his people, and his people is defined as a much broader topic than just the Jewish people. This is for the Gentiles. This is for all nations. And that this person would be born in Bethlehem. And of course, we know that this was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, who was born in Bethlehem. If we then turn to the book of Isaiah and go into chapter 7, uh, verse 14, we find this uh, powerful statement. And we actually covered this earlier on our debate on the virgin birth. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, and you know, in the New Testament, when it talks about that, of course, Emmanuel is a Hebrew word, which a Greek wouldn't understand. So the writer of the gospel translates that. And he says in Greek, he explains this, this means God with us. So Messiah is born in Bethlehem, and he is not merely a human figure. He is in some sense, God with us, redeeming us and bringing us back into relationship with himself. In the same book of Isaiah, and by the way, the entire scroll of Isaiah is available from 200 BC. Amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls in uh, Israel was discovered a complete roll of Isaiah dating from 200 BC. So all of these prophecies we have in hand from a document, the oldest of which copy actually lists all these things about Jesus 200 years before his birth. And we know the book was written far earlier than that, around 700 BC. But what's, what does chapter 9 tell us? In verse 1, it talks about that this will be a way that God will honor Galilee of the Gentiles, meaning this is how God is going to redeem all peoples, not just the Jews, but all who take faith in Messiah. And then coming to verse 6, we find the following powerful statement. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, this same Emmanuel that we saw previously. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Mighty God? Yes, Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Is Jesus the Father? No, wait a minute. Weren't we told that Father, different thing, Jesus is submitted to the Father? But you see, God is one. <coughs> And in that sense, I agree with my Muslim friends. God is one, but he is also everlasting father, prince of peace. Because you see, Sharia cannot give us peace. Sharia can only condemn us because we fall short. Only the Savior, the Messiah, can give you peace. 
There are many other passages. We could talk about the coming of Jesus, uh, riding on a donkey, humble, going into the kingdom. Part of the reality of being the Son of God is to demonstrate humility. Now, does God demonstrate humility? Well, yes, in the person of Jesus Christ, he comes as a servant to set us an example. But most of the remaining prophecies we're going to look at have to do really with the final week of Jesus' life has to do with his suffering on our behalf. If we go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 7 and verse 14, we read the following powerful, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm in the wrong place, I hopped up. Uh, if we go to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 22, there is a remarkable passage in here that King David wrote. This is from the Zabur, and King David is writing about a situation that seems to be describing himself, and yet we know that King David never experienced this. This was not something that ever happened to him. But in verses 16 through 18, this is what he said. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced, or if you want, wounded, uh, the word that you wanted to translate that as uh, earlier. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. Now, this is a very vague kind of an allusion, five minutes, to the crucifixion. Uh, crucifixion didn't exist at this point in history, even though the Quran says that it was existing from the time of Pharaoh, but yet it didn't. And that's why it's de described very obliquely here, because it was the Romans, not Pharaoh, who invented crucifixion. And he goes on then to describe what happens to him. Uh, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And this is exactly what the Roman soldiers did with Jesus after they had crucified him. If you go on to Isaiah chapter 53, we find an even more powerful description of the prophecies concerning Jesus. And in this passage, it talks about Jesus' accomplishments on the cross, where he says... He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He was smitten, stricken by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb for our sins. Jesus is the healer, and even the Quran affirms Jesus is the great healer who raises the dead, heals the sick, gives sight to the blind. And most importantly from Isaiah, we understand he is the one who redeems us. Just a final thought. In Daniel chapter 7, we get a picture of the second coming of Christ. We've talked about how the prophecies of his first coming are fulfilled. But here is a prophecy that has not been fulfilled yet. In chapter 7 of Daniel, verses 13 and 14, we read this about Jesus. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Given is an aspect of humility. doesn't mean that God can take it away from him. Jesus said, all power and authority is given to me. Therefore, go, meaning our going is eternal. We are never losing that commission from Jesus. Therefore, it is an eternal commission, not one taken away. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. They worshipped Jesus. They worshipped this Son of Man. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. It's not an authority that God will take away from him. He has it eternally. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And the book of Revelation gives us a picture of the fulfillment of that reality. Jesus is coming back. When he does, he will establish his kingdom, and his kingdom will never end. And that will be a kingdom of peace, of his kingdom and of its peace. There will be no end. And so that's our invitation to every person, whether Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or nominal Christian who just has the name of Christian but doesn't know Jesus Christ. The invitation through these prophecies is that God has demonstrated through documents hundreds of years before the time of Christ. He has predicted everything that would happen of significance, particularly the final week of Jesus' life and his suffering and his atonement and his sacrifice on our behalf. 
And then the scripture goes on to point out he is the one raised from the dead. He is the one coming again. He is the one before whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, God the Father, Jesus, which one is it? They are a trinity in eternal relationship. And in that relationship, you, my friend, created in the image of God, are invited to enter into that relationship with God. That is the message of the Bible. That is the message of God's mission in the Bible, which from Genesis 3 to Revelation 22 is his message to bring you back into right relationship with himself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, going to hear also the opening statement, Brother Osama, uh, and you're going to get 13 minutes. Sure. So uh, starting now? Sure. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Jacob. Thank you very much, Dr. David, uh, for your presentation. And thank you, ABN uh, Trinity, for having me today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> in regards to Prophet Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, first of all, we have, you have to, we have to know that uh, you're not debating an atheist or a Jew. Um, I don't believe Jesus is a bastard whose mother had a sex with a Roman soldier and had him. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe uh, he was prophesied in the, old in the old scriptures. And yes, we believe he's God's Messiah and the last prophet and messenger to the people of Israel. Um, however, he is not the creator of the universe. Um, and also many of the so-called prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament are actually about Muhammad because the prophecies were made about two people, not just one. And I'll get to those. Uh, but first, uh, it's important to know that Jesus uh, in the Old Testament is called servant. And the Hebrew word is abd, as my last name, Osama Abdallah, slave of Allah. It means slave. And it's the same, same exact word used for slaves of the Jews that Jews could buy and sell and inherit and pass down as inheritance and will them to other people, etc. You find that in Exodus chapter 21 and Leviticus chapter 25 and Exodus uh, uh, chapter 1 again and, uh, and many other uh, books about slaves. So Jesus is God's abd, slave. He's subject to God. He's God's subject. Uh, also, in the um, book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 36, God has made him master and Christ. God made him master and Christ. Um, also, Jesus, when he was asked about the hour uh, in Matthew, chapter 24, verse 36, when the judgment day will come, he said, I don't know when the day of judgment will come. No one knows when the day of judgment will come. Only God alone knows. So if he's my creator, he has lied right there because he should have. I mean, he does know after all. He's God, right? But no, he doesn't know because he's not a creator. He, he's a creation. Um, in Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 6, uh, Jesus called mighty God, uh, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, mighty uh, eternal father. Eternal father means rabbi, by the way, uh, because Jesus is the highest uh, uh, rabbi and priest. Uh, Jewish priests are called father. Uh, this is where you get Catholics, Roman Catholics call their priest father. Um, and uh, so Jesus is the, the grandfather, if you will, of the Jews, the grand priest, rabbi. As to mighty God, this is a godly name. It doesn't, I don't know what it's supposed to prove here because everyone in the Bible is called, every believer is called God. You are all gods and you are all sons of God. That's Jesus told the is the followers in the New Testament and also in Psalm chapter 83 it says that as well you are all gods and you're all sons of God you can go to www.answering-christianity.com slash God title one word dot htm um, and you can see all the godly titles Gabriel strong God it means Gabriel the angel Gabriel it means strong God does he does it mean he is God Almighty after all um, so Jesus being called El Gabor or, or Gabriel, Gabriel, uh, they're really just the same thing. Mighty God, you know, godly names like Michael, like God, someone is like God, <clears throat> etc. cetera. So, um, so that's that. Uh, also, according to the New Testament and in, in, uh, in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 14, 
verse 18, Psalm chapter 110, verse 4, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, and Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 20, Jesus had to be in according to Melchizedek, who was the Jews' high priest. Jews considered him high priest, but he came before Judaism, I agree. Uh, who had no father and no mother and no beginning and no end. The Bible says this, no beginning and no end. If Jesus, if this was said about Jesus, which it never was, never, never was never said about Jesus, if Jesus had no beginning and no end, people would be all over it, Trinitarians. Oh, there we go, it proves that he is God. But pay attention here, it was said about someone other than Jesus. Has no beginning and no end. Okay, yet you don't consider Melchizedek God, because he's a creation of God. So, and Jesus had to be in according to Melchizedek, in, you know, in the line, in the same path, in the same school of thought of Melchizedek. So, he couldn't be God. Also, in John chapter 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God, when, Tom, when uh, Thomas called Jesus that, um, again, godly title, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, Moses was called the God of, Abraham, of uh, Aaron, Pharaoh, and implied to all the believers. Okay, that he is the God of all of them, the God. Okay, so and uh, and Jesus in Mark chapter ten verse eighteen, he, he told his people, "Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone." And in uh, in Mark chapter twelve verse twenty nine, "Hear, O Israel," Jesus said, "The Lord our God, our God is one, not your God, our God." Okay. And before every miracle Jesus performed, he needed he, he seeked God's permission because he could not perform a single miracle without God's permission. He was powerless. God had to enable it for him. That's in John chapter 11, verses 41 through 42. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, after, heard his prayer to perform the miracle. And he, he says also that they may uh, believe that you have sent me. And... Uh, and Jesus said in John chapter 5, verses 36 through 38, Jesus said that God had assigned him work, and God is Jesus' witness. Okay? So, and um, Alpha and Omega, um, again, Revelation chapter 1, um, verse 5, it gives distinct, uh, distinction between God and Jesus. It says, Grace and peace to you. From, who, from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. And from Jesus Christ. There's a distinction there between the two. You can't say he's God Almighty. And even if Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, I'll take that. Okay? It doesn't mean anything. Melchizedek had no beginning and no end. It doesn't matter what, what you call Jesus. As long as he's not the creator. He said, I'm not a creator. I don't know when the judgment day will come. Okay? If he is my creator, then he has lied when he said he doesn't know when judgment day will come. Because he knows when judgment day will come. That's a lie from him. From right out of his mouth. If he's my creator. And I don't believe my God is a liar. And he's not the creator. He never claimed it. You always have to imply that and conclude that. You have to insert it into the text. Through implying it. The text doesn't say it. Um, John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus said, My God and your God. And um, also Jesus didn't know um, the unseen. Like he asked, was this your idea? In John chapter 18, verse 34. I thought he's his creator, right? Why is he asking, was this your idea? He should know, right? He's, he's the God. And Mark chapter 9, verse 21, how long has this been like? And Luke chapter 8, verse 45, who touched me? You know, he was asking who, which of the people touched him. Well, you should know, right? You're God. <laughs> and you should, you should have told me there's only five minutes left. <laughs> uh, John chapter um, 8, verse 58, I am, you know, before Abraham was, I am. No, it, I, I use three Greek English dictionaries, answering Christianity.com slash I am, I am dot htm. Um, I was, I have, I existed, I, I am, it also means, but it means all of these things. And Jesus didn't say it in Greek, by the way. Greek is a translation. Ego imi is not what Jesus uttered from his mouth. Okay, that's a translation. We don't even know what Jesus said originally. The Aramaic or Hebrew or whatever it was written in, or whatever Jesus spoke, is not even there. We don't have the original text. So we don't, people say ego imi means I am. No, first of all, it doesn't. It's not limited to that. And the context of the text, before Abraham was, yes, I was there before him. That's what Jesus really said. 
And uh, ego even wasn't even what he said, verbatim. So that's that. And uh, Jesus in chapter 8, verse 28, I, I do nothing of myself. And John chapter 5, verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, I would be a liar. I thought he's my creator, right? He could bear witness of himself. The God of the Old Testament did. He didn't need witnesses. Okay. So if Jesus is my creator, and he says, if I bear witness of myself, I will be a liar. He has witnessed a lie on himself. He just, bore, he just uttered lies from his mouth. Um, and I can't do anything of my own initiative. Again, he had to seek God's permission. That's John chapter 5, verse 30. Um, so there's so much to talk about. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. I mentioned this in the old debate, uh, previous, old debate previous debate. You know, when you have, say, he and him, he and him, you plug in Jesus and God. You know, this is what our brother, Trinitarian brothers do. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, God, not Jesus, all things were created. Trinitarians say it's, it's Jesus. And the proof of this is first book of Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, for, from whom all things came and for, uh, for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Through whom, by whom, okay, you see, so there's a distinction there. And uh, by the way, all believers created from the image of God, the Bible defines it as carrying the good attributes of God, being truthful, being merciful, being compassionate, all these beautiful things uh, are what the attribute of God is. That's in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8, uh, Jesus had no authority. Authority had to be given to Jesus uh, to execute limited judgment on earth. That's John chapter 5, verse 27 through 30. Uh, and chapter 10, verse uh, 18 through 21. Chapter 17, verses 20, 21 through 22. And Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. John chapter 8, verse 28. And Jesus said, the grand judge is God. In uh, John chapter 8, verses 49 through 50. I read verse 50 here. I'm not seeking glory for myself, Jesus speaking. But there is one, uh, there's one who seeks it, and he is the judge, okay? He is the grand judge, God, not Jesus. Jesus was given authority to judge, yes, just like all prophets. That's how they pass judgments, is that, that's how they pass the laws. But God is the ultimate judge. Um, uh, and we are, all believers are the heirs of God, and Jesus one minute. <laughs> the heir of God, uh, but all believers as well. Um, there's so much to talk about. Um, I'd like to conclude this, and I'll get into the prophecies later. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. Oh, look at Jesus' prayer to see that really he's our God, right? O Father in heaven, hallowed thy be by thy name. Thy king, uh, kingdom come. Thy will be done. Not my will, your will. Okay, in earth and in heaven. On earth and in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Uh, and forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. Okay, as we forgive our uh, debtors, uh, or yeah, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus praying to God, okay, and thine is kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Glory is to you forever, and he's praying to God, telling him you are, you are the glorified one. You forgive us, and thy will be done, and all that. How do you see Jesus is my creator here? Uh, please help me here, Abdullah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be taking uh, three minutes a break, and we would love for you to come back with us and uh, see this debate, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that everybody will be there to see us and uh, support ABN, and you have a blessed one. To our viewers all over the world, you can watch us by satellite through the following frequencies. For North America and Canada, please join us on the Galaxy 19 satellite, frequency 11966 horizontal. For Europe and Middle East, join us on the Hotbird satellite, frequency 12111 vertical. For Australia and New Zealand, please join us on the Optus 2 satellite, frequency 12546 vertical. 
For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. To all our viewers, you can now watch our shows on the following platforms, such as Android tablets, Android boxes, Android phones, a Chromecast stick, your smart TV, or a Roku stick. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. You can now watch ABN in the Trinity Channel on your iPhone and iPad. Search for ABN Sat in the App Store. You can watch all the following channels. The Arabic Channel, the English Trinity Channel, the Worship Channel, the Surath Channel, the Kurdish Channel, the al Qudus Channel, the Prayer Channel, and a special channel for Europe and the Middle East. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Watch ABN on your TV. With the Chromecast stick, you can simply connect your phone to the television to watch shows. Download the ABN Sat app and click on the Chromecast button. Need help installing? Contact us at 248-416-1300. Welcome back everyone and you are joining us for our first or second debate I should say during Christmas season. Today we are discussing the prophecies and foretelling of the first coming of the Messiah. Taking the affirmative position is Dr. David Cashin, Professor of Intercultural Studies at Columbia Biblical Seminary, and his opponent is Osama Abdullah, Webmaster of Answering-Christianity.com. Now we all will continue into our second round of the debate, which consists with each debate having 10 minutes rebuttal, and then an eight minute crossfire. I will be providing warning at five minutes, at two minutes, and one minute. And we're going to start, Dr. Cashin. I'm going to get my uh, clock ready here. And we said 10 minutes. So, uh, starting yes. now. Well, we've been having a lot of fun in this debate on prophecies in the Bible. And I've been very impressed with, with my Muslim friend, uh, Mr. Osama. Uh, he's been quoting the Bible like crazy. So I thought maybe it's time for me to have a little fun with the Quran. Um, and to say, are Muslims Trinitarian? Well, I had a Muslim friend in Bangladesh who actually was Trinitarian. He wrote a book entitled Tritopak Allah Shotto, which means the Trinity, the truth of God. He was a Trinitarian Muslim. And uh, in his studies of the Quran, he had found Kalimatullah, word of God. He had found Ru'ullah, that is the spirit of God, and of course, Allah himself. And he'd come to the conclusion that the only way you could have relationship with God was by having a trinity. In other words, God who is relational in his own character and person. And I did throw out a question in our very first debate, which you still haven't answered. I'd, I'd like to hear your answer because, you know, the Quran says that Jesus is the Kalimatullah, the word of God. Well, we know that by the word of God, the universe was created. So my question to you earlier was, is Jesus creation or is Jesus Creator, I'll leave that question to you. You made a, a large point of this distinction between Jesus and the Father. Well, frankly, thank you. Those distinctions that you pointed out are clearly in the New Testament, and they have a purpose of delineating the Trinity and the differing roles of God in that Trinity. Jesus is the Son who submits to the Father and who illustrates to all believers what it means to be in submission to the Father. And how else could he do that if he simply worked in his position of glory that he will have at the end of time? He doesn't make much of an example for us because we surely cannot imitate that. So the distinctions that you note between Jesus and the Father are built into the text. They are meant to indicate the reality of Trinity and the differing roles of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the redemptive plan. I still haven't heard much about the prophecies of Muhammad. Uh, looking forward to that in your rebuttal, perhaps. But, you know, um, Muhammad is dead. And he's not coming back. So how can he have an eternal kingdom? How is he supposed to rule? How is he supposed to be the one who comes on the clouds with great power? I'm, I'm just curious of how Muhammad could fulfill all these prophecies of the Bible, uh, which I think are very clearly fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, by the way, Jesus did not lie uh, when he said that he didn't know. Jesus was simply uh, showing his submission to his father. And uh, I, I take that as, as a, a comfort to me. I don't know everything, but I'm called to walk by faith. And Jesus is my example of walking by faith. Uh, for he uh, did not have that knowledge from the Father. And I take that as a wonderful comfort to me that I can imitate Jesus in that regard. But as regards our relationship to God, I'd like you to look at a couple of interesting passages. Uh, since we're quoting the Bible a lot, let's take a look at Romans uh, chapter uh, 8 and verses 14 to 16. Uh, this is really a fascinating part of the Bible that talks about what God accomplished in Christ in redeeming us to himself. And in Romans 8, uh, Paul talks about our nature uh, and, and the kind of relationship that we have with God. And, and this is something that's so beautiful because I see so many of my Muslim friends filled with fear. In fact, the imam at the masjid we, invite, uh, invest, or we uh, visited yesterday, uh, he said over and over again, we as Muslims, we live in fear. We live in fear. Yes, uh, of course you live in fear. Coercive violence inspires fear. And if Allah is merely coercing you to go and obey him because of the threat of the fires of hell, then yes, you live in continual fear. But when Jesus was resurrected, he said something very different to his disciples. He said to them, peace be with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives peace. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Because you see, love, perfect love, casts out fear. Perfect love casts out dread of judgment. And so what does Paul say to us in our relationship to God through Jesus Christ? He says, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him, that is Christ, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, Five I know minutes. as a Muslim, you can never call yourself a child of God. That would be blasphemy. But a Christian knows the assurance of salvation and the adoption that we have through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Um, Again, you use many interpretations from the texts as, as you go through them. Uh, well, this is really about Jesus. This is about the Father. Uh, oh, this text really, it doesn't mean this, but it means something else. And I, I feel like I'm listening to a person who can't see the forest for the trees. He's looking at each individual tree, and he's trying to pluck off a, a flower or a branch or a leaf that he said, oh, it means this, and oh, it means that. And he's not seeing hundreds upon hundreds, indeed thousands of passages, a great forest that all point, points to the same reality. <coughs> Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Redeemer. And through his sacrifice, we come into eternal relationship with God as sons and daughters of God. This is the prophecy of the Old Testament. It's the promise of the Old Testament. And we as Christians live upon that promise. Our salvation is not dependent upon our perfect obedience to Sharia. For the law cannot save, it can only show us our sin. So what do we need? We need a savior. And we need relationship. And my Muslim friend in Bangladesh who wrote Tritopakalar Shoto, the Trinity, the truth of God, he expressed that longing of the human spirit that says, I want to know God. I want to experience God. I want a relationship with God. And in fact, that's why we were made. By the way, uh, this is an interesting point from Islamic law. I've been looking for this for years, and finally I found it. What I found was in Al-Bukhari, there is actually a passage, only one, anywhere in the Hadith, where it says that humankind is made in the image of God. And I said, Alhamdulillah, it's there. It's in their passage. And I thought it was gone. Now, it's actually true that I, I think probably that our, our good friend, had picked up some of the ideas of Judaism and Christianity and unknowingly he got them into his hadith not knowing what orthodox Islam would later come to say because really in that passage he's reflecting back on Genesis 1 that we are made in the image of God made for eternal relationship with God 
Why are we like him? So that we may know him. And all the prophecies of the whole Bible, both in their giving in the Old Testament and their fulfillment in the Old Testament and the picture of what is coming in the New Testament, how they will eventually be filled when the Son of Man comes back to be eternal Lord and judge of this earth and to establish his kingdom. Now the kingdom of our God has become the kingdom of his Christ here on earth. That is our hope. That is our future. And that is what we preach as Christians. That's why we obey the great commission of Jesus, given four times in each of the canonical gospels and in the book of Acts, a calling to every Christian to testify to Jesus, to the nations, every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And that means even Muslims. Now, I'm sad to say we're not allowed to do that in the Muslim world today. You can't go to Saudi Arabia and preach the message of Jesus. Uh, they would do to you the same thing that Daulat Islamiyah would do to you. That would be Bismillah Rahman Rahim, and off would come your head. But you see, where is Rahmat? Where is Rahim? Every execution that I've watched on Daulat Islamiyah's videotapes, and I've watched them all, they all have these pronouncements to the God of mercy, to the God of grace. But in the actual One killing, minutes. I don't see any grace. I don't see any mercy. Where is it? That's why I said to you earlier, make hijrah to Jesus. He is the Rahmat. He is the Rahim. He is the mercy. He is the grace. He is the Son of God who died for us on the cross and has provided redemption that is eternal, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. We are sons and daughters of God. Dr. Keshin, thank you very much. Now we're going to... Listen for the 10 minutes rebuttal. Sure. When you're ready, brother. Sure, brother. Ready? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, uh, David. Appreciate your presentation and your... Um, as to uh, Jesus um, came from Bethlehem, Israel, but his second coming will be from Arabia. Uh, if you read in... I'll uh, show it to you right now in... Uh, lost it, closed it by accident. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 24, verses 25 through 27, see, I have told you ahead of time, so if he, anyone tells you he is, there he is, do not go out, there he is in the, uh, in the wilderness, do not go out, there he, he is in the inner rooms, do not go out uh, and do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And the Bible thoroughly defined the East to be the Arabs. In fact, uh, God said, in fact, the Bible says also the glory of God will come from the East. Um, let me uh, quote him for you here, if I can find the uh, link here. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I'll just reopen it. Um, let me quote here a few passages for you regarding the East. Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 2, and I saw the glory of God coming from the east. And Hosea chapter 13, verse 15, an east wind from, wind from the Lord, uh, east wind from the Lord will come. And Islam came um, from the east. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 42, 41 and 42, God Almighty will send a new servant with a new covenant. He will come from the east, and God defines which east is that. From the lands of Kedar. Kedar is one of Ishmael's sons, and he existed in what's called today Central uh, Arabia, in Saudi Arabia. Jesus never came from that, folks. Okay? And the glory of God will come from the east. And in Isaiah chapter 35 and Isaiah chapter 60, God will uh, establish his house of, of worship in the desert where Kedar lives. And the path to that desert will be called the, the path of holiness. That's not Jerusalem. And uh, in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 14, 15 also, 24, verse 15, Therefore the east, in the east, give glory to the Lord. Okay? And Isaiah chapter 41, verse, 20, verse 2, as I said, Who has stirred up one from the east? Okay, and I, like I said, in Isaiah 41 and Isaiah 42, God defined in 42, Isaiah chapter 42, where the east is. 
And um, also prophet jo uh, J uh, Job was also in Job chapter 1 verse uh, 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 3. Uh, was the greatest of all men of the East. Okay? So, yeah, we know Christ came from Israel, but he's not going to return from Israel. He's going to return in Arab. In fact, Prophet Muhammad made that prophecy, and he gave the precise location. He'll come from the eastern side of the suburbs of Damascus. Okay? From the Arabs. And Muhammad came from the lands of Kedar. And the Bible gives uh, prophecies about two uh, chariots, one riding a donkey, which Jesus fulfilled, uh, uh, and when he entered Jerusalem, and one riding a camel, okay, that's Prophet Muhammad. And uh, I'll give you those uh, in a second here. Um, and uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, God will send a, a prophet like Moses from your, uh, from their brothers, the Israelites. Who are the brothers of the Israelites? The Ishmaelites. Who's the brother of Isaac? Ishmael. Ishmael is 13 years older than Isaac. He's the older brother. I will send a prophet like, like you, Moses, from their brothers. From their brothers. That's precisely in the English translation and, and, in, uh, and in, uh, in the commentary. Uh, and also in other verses like Obadiah chapter 1 verses 8 through 13. And... Uh, and uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1 through 5, the word all meant, spoke about the Arabs being their uh, uh, Arabs, their cousins. So the word means brother and means cousin. Definitely referring to the uh, uh, Ishmaelites. Um, in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, they asked Elijah, when, uh, uh, John the Baptist, when he came, Who are you? Are you? Some said he is Elijah, others said he is the Christ. Others said he is the prophet, the prophet. There's Christ and there's the prophet to come. And, uh, uh, and uh, here in, uh, in Genesis chapter 16, verses 11 through 13 in, from the Knox Bible, um, it, it, it defines here the Ishmaelites being the eastern, the ones coming from the east. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and Judges, chapter 7, verse 12, there were Midian and Amalek and all the tribes of the east, Arabs, east, 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 okay? The glory of God will come from the east. Jesus will come from the east. As, as, uh, lightning, as lightning is visible, that comes from the east, is visible in the west, so will be my return, the, the return of the Son of Man. He's not going to come from Palestine or Jerusalem or, or Israel. I'm Palestinian. We call it Palestine. It was called Philistine before the Exodus. He'll come from uh, Arabia. So, uh, yeah, we, there are pro definitely prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course there are. But it's not just all about him. There's the Arabian prophet that our Jewish and Christian brothers who are experts in the Bible hide. Okay? I read a lot of the Bible. And, I, you know, and with the aid of other brothers and sisters work. I, I, you know, I mean, it's crystal clear to me that there's uh, someone else who will come from the lands of Kedar uh, that will come be besides Jesus. And that's Muhammad, folks. That's Muhammad. The house of God will be established in the desert of Kedar. Isaiah chapter uh, 30, uh, uh, 35 and 60. Go read them. Um, So that's that. Uh, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, 11, in the Geneva Bible, uh, 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 chapter, Isaiah 42, chapter 42, verse 11, footnote in the Geneva Bible, it says, meaning the Arabians under whom he comprehends all people of the East. The, 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 the Geneva Bible defined it precisely. The Arabs, the Arabians, okay, he will come from the Arabs. He will not be a Jewish prophet. And in Isaiah 42, God commands the entire house of Jacob, the entire house of Jacob, to follow him and to not be afraid of him. Never once was this said to any Jewish prophet, not even to Jesus himself. But because he's a foreigner, non-Israelite, he commanded the entire house of Jacob, house of Jacob. That's how God addressed them. Do not be afraid of him and you must follow him. Okay? Because he's a non-Israelite. He will come from the Arabians, from the east. All right? 
One minute? Well, almost. Okay. <laughs> I, rest my, I rest my case. Thank you. There's a lot more, but... Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Actually, we're going to have a, an eight-minute... Uh, sure. Rebuttal or crossfire, actually. And uh, thank you, thank you uh, Osama. We're going to start after Kashin. We're going to start with the two minutes. So, um, okay. if I set my. Okay. All right. Um, I'm only going to make one point. And you're a great scholar. You've studied a great deal. There's something that you haven't studied. And uh, even the Geneva Bible makes this mistake. Where in the Bible does it say that Ishmael? Kedar and Nabaioth are the fathers of the Arabs. It does not say that anywhere. And in fact, the idea that the Ishmaelites are the father of the Arabs is an invention of the first century AD, which is an interesting point because it's out of a Jewish document, a Gaza manuscript dated from about 100 AD when the Jews were running away from the Romans after the destruction of Jerusalem. And so they went to Arabia, and they were afraid of being attacked. So they invented a fictive relationship that the Jews were brothers of the Arabs through Ishmael, Kedar, and Nebaioth. But in actual fact, nowhere in, that, in the Bible is that taught. And the idea itself is what you might call Jewish Apocrypha, written hundreds of years after the time of the scriptures. So you do a lot of critical study, you just don't study the right stuff. In actual fact, your whole argument is based on an invented Jewish fairy tale from the first century. And uh, look it up, study it carefully, and you'll find that there's no basis. So east, here's a simple point. If I'm standing in Singapore, what's east of me? East, west, north, south are relative terms. What is important is who were the promises made to. Your argument about Muhammad is entirely based on Ishmael, Kedar, and Nabaioth, and these people are not the relatives of the Arabs. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Kashin, Brother Osama. Sure. You okay. get the two minutes. Thank you, Dr. Kashin. Um, uh, Ishmael uh, went to uh, Arabia. In fact, even Paul uh, references in the book of uh, Galatians um, when he, he talked about Hagar and uh, went to Arabia. Thank you. Went to Arabia. And uh, also in, um, in, uh, in uh, uh, where did I put it? Oh, it's the other one. I have like a million things open here. Uh, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 51, verses, uh, verse 33, uh, Arabia has not met yet its threshold, and the time of her harvest shall come, shall come. The time of Arabia's harvest shall come. And there's another verse in the Bible that I can't pull out right now. It's in Isaiah. The burden shall be put upon Arabia. Okay? Burden means God's burden, God's responsibility, God's um, mission will be God's new covenant as a servant, new servant and new covenant One minute. will be put upon Arabia. I'll find that verse and I'll send it to you. And again, the house of Jacob was commanded to follow them. And uh, uh, you asked me, prove that Ishmael, well, again, the lands of the east, okay? We are the eastern side of, Jer of Israel and the lands of Kedar are known. Uh, uh, in fact, there is a map that defines where they are. Uh, that lands of Dina, uh, Didan, uh, uh, Edomite, the Edomites, Edom, which is northern Arabia in Jordan, uh, Kedar, seconds. and uh, Timan. These are all lands that are uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and in fact, there are names that are still in Saudi Arabia today. And, uh, uh, and, and they are mentioned in the Bible. These are all Arabic names. Um, uh, so, yeah. And, and also, according to Islam, um, we, you know, this is where uh, the black stone God Almighty sent this asteroid, and NASA proved that it was an asteroid for Abraham and Ishmael to build the house of God Almighty, which the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 30 and 65 will be established in the, in the desert. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Thank Brother Osama. Dr. Keshin, you get two minutes. Time. You get two minutes. All right. Thank you. Well, I really thank you because you have taken to me to the one place in the Bible that I think is a genuine prophecy of Islam. Yes, sir. Chapter 4 of Galatians is, I believe, a prophecy of Islam. But what does it say? Uh, Kedar and Nebaioth were not the fathers of the Arabs. 
but they represented a lifestyle that God says will not lead you to the truth. And here's what the prophecy says. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, you could translate that, Sharia. Are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the woman represents two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai, which is actually in Sinai Peninsula, but he says in Arabia, because you know Arabia means a whole huge area, and frankly Arabia at that point is not to the east, it's really to the west. But what does he say about Mount Sinai? One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now seconds. Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. In other words, we are children of God, not slaves, through the message of Jesus Christ, not Muhammad. You still have nine seconds. Thank you, Dr. Geshen. You get the two minutes. Uh, when, when the somewhere. Canaanite woman approached Jesus and uh, asked for his blessing to cure her daughter, Jesus told her, I, I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel, not for their dogs. When she showed, yes, as a pagan Arab, any pagan, not just Arab, is a dog, according to Jesus, uh, to, 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 any, uh, to any believer. But when she showed she believed, he told her, woman, you have faith. So Paul's message there about we are sons of um, uh, slave, actually that shows he's a false charlatan, which I can debate you on that because Jesus came to free all slaves. And Jesus washed even the, the feet of his, uh, uh, of his disciples uh, because he commanded the masters to, to, to be kind and, and, and free their slaves. And here comes Paul says, oh, you know, we are the sons of the free woman. And these uh, N words there are uh, the sons of the slave woman. Uh, that's not Jesus teaching that contradicts Jesus that slaps Jesus teachings right in the face so that that's thank you very much that One shows uh, Paul is false um, but anyway uh, dr. David uh, uh, you know um, whether we're sons of a slave woman or not that really has nothing to do with anything I mean as a believer I, as I demonstrated lands of Kedar and the new covenant new servant and all that and Jesus himself will return from the east as Lightning is visible, that comes from the east is visible in the west, so will be return, the return of the Son of Man. And he tells him, if you, if you hear people say, he, there he is, he returned in Jerusalem, or there he is, don't believe it. He, I will return from the east, and the glory of God will come from the east. I quoted several verses from the Bible. Seconds or less. So, yeah, the Jews had their covenant, but God Almighty said to the Jews, um, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, the day is coming, declares the word, when I will, the, word, the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. A new covenant. So all of this Hagar, Ishmael, slaves and all that will come to an end and a new covenant will come. Thank you, uh, Brother Salma. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude our second uh, uh, time and we will come back uh, in our uh, third uh, period to... Uh, more, qu more uh, listening to our debaters here, and I'm hoping you're going to be with us. You can now watch ABN in the Trinity channel on your iPhone and iPad. Search for ABN Sat in the App Store. You can watch all the following channels. The Arabic channel, the English Trinity channel, the Worship channel, the Surath channel, the Kurdish channel, the al Qadus channel, the prayer channel, and a special channel for Europe and the Middle East. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. To our viewers all over the world, you can watch us by satellite through the following frequencies. For North America and Canada, please join us on the Galaxy 19 satellite, frequency 11966 horizontal. For Europe and Middle East, Join us on the Hotbird satellite, frequency 12111 vertical. For Australia and New Zealand, please join us on the Optus 2 satellite, 
frequency 12546 vertical. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Watch ABN on your TV. With the Chromecast stick, you can simply connect your phone to the television to watch shows. Download the ABN Sat app and click on the Chromecast button. Need help installing? Contact us at 248 416 1300. Ladies and gentlemen of the ABN, uh, thank you for being with us for our debate, our second debate. And we're going to start out again. Uh, uh, we are trying to, to see uh, the point of view of uh, Islam and Christianity when it comes to the Messianic prophecies. Uh, I want to encourage everybody also to help ABN uh, at this season of giving. And I thank you very much for all the helps that you are giving. Uh, we, we're going into uh, the third round, and we were going to go into an eight-minute crossfire. And we started this, this debate, the second one, with Dr. Cashin. And you will be our first person to go on for the eight minutes. And if you don't mind, I'm going to set the time here. If you, are you ready for it? I am ready. All right. Here we go. Well, I begin with a question. Uh, you finished your debate, uh, Osama, by stating that Paul is false. He's wrong. He's, he's bad. Throw, throw him out. Why did you then cite him as support for your arguments earlier? How could someone who is false and wrong and totally not something to be paid attention to also be a foundation for one of your arguments? And this is part of your problem in logic, that you hop from thing to thing according to whether it fits your system, but then when something doesn't fit your system, you discount it and say, oh, this can't be anything from God. I don't have any problem with contradictions in my system. It's the word of God, and that I can trust it in its testimony. Remember that Paul himself in this passage from Galatians chapter 4 says that this is figurative language. Uh, he's not condemning Arabs or Gentiles or anyone else as people who are dogs. Uh, although I would argue that Jesus has the right to challenge people and that's what he did with the Syrophoenician woman. And that is really what elicited her response of faith, which is why he accepted that. And that doesn't mean that he's not concerned about the nations because his great commandment to us was to take the good news of his sacrifice and resurrection and coming kingdom and to preach that in all the world as a witness to every nation and then the end will come. But since Paul is speaking figuratively here, he's saying that there are two separate covenants that human beings follow. And the whole earth could be defined in this way, not just Muslims, but Hindus, Buddhists, uh, followers of communism, uh, atheists, all of them have their systems of rules and regulations by which they say, if we could just do this, then we would have paradise on earth. You know, the communists used to say that. We're establishing the classless society. And what does Dawlat Islamiya say? We are establishing the kingdom of God on earth. We are using the Manhaj al Nabua. Okay? the methodology of the prophet to establish the perfect kingdom of God on earth. All the rules and regulations, the law of Hinduism, the law of Buddhism, everyone tells us how we ought to behave. All the things that we ought to do to make a good society. But nobody does these things. They all fall short. And in fact, even though Dawlat Islamiya, the Islamic State, continually talks about following and obe obeying the Sunnah and their Propaganda films are saturated with Quran and Sunnah. 
Nevertheless, I go into the mosque here and the Imam tells me this has nothing to do with Islam. And I feel a little bit like Dr. Phil. I almost want to say, you can't solve a problem you're not willing to acknowledge. So, and it's a problem with everyone. And, and Paul is essentially saying this. Those who think that they can get to God by means of the law, they live a lifestyle of slavery and they always fail. And frankly, Daulat Islamia will fail. As will any utopian structure that says that we will establish the kingdom of God on earth by means of coercive violence. And by the way, that's what politics is. Even democracy is based on coercive violence. That's why we have police. Try speeding down the road here and see how, long, how far you get. The reality is you cannot come to God by works of the law. As the scripture says, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God. This is why Messiah is promised in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New. We cannot come to God by the means of our own efforts. And I'm not saying those efforts are wrong. It's not bad to be a good law-abiding member of a society. And Sharia, many aspects of it, is perfectly acceptable to me as a Christian. Not all of it, surely, but most of it is acceptable. But it won't save you. It won't give you a relationship with God. And if you think you can establish the kingdom of God on earth by means of that through coercive violence, you will have hell on earth. Which is why Paul speaks of these people as being slaves, enslaved to something that cannot save them. The law of God cannot save you. He then points figuratively to the son of the free woman, the son who is a son, not a slave, the son who can know and experience God. That's the calling of the entire Bible from beginning to end. That is our promise. That is our future if we will merely take faith in him. It is by faith that you have been saved, not of works that no man should boast. Now, yes, we're called to do good works. But you know, when Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate said to him, are you a king? And the response of Jesus in John chapter 19 was simply to say, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my disciples would fight for me. And many other religious leaders have called their followers to fight for them. And I would argue that they have never established the righteousness and the righteous kingdom of God by that means. Jesus alone said, my kingdom is not of this world. My end by way of understanding, if it were, my disciples would fight for me, but nevertheless, my kingdom is not of this world. And he was then taken and crucified upon a cross. God himself forswore the opportunity to be protected by his own disciples because he knew that that pathway was the pathway of redemption, the pathway of new life, the pathway of forgiveness, the pathway of restoration, the pathway of peace, the pathway of relationship with God. Make hijra to Isa, my Muslim friend. Make hijra to Isa. There is a kingdom coming, but it is not a kingdom that any human being can establish by means of the works of the law or by the coercive violence of man, because coercive violence always produces munafikun. You know, that word never appears except once in an oblique reference in the, Medi the Meccan surahs of the Quran. Munafikun as a word appears in the Medinan surahs and it occurs about 20 times. Why does it appear there and not in the Meccan surahs? For the simple reason that now we're trying to establish the kingdom of God on earth by means of coercive violence and that atmosphere of fear creates Munafikun. And so the prophet tries to deal with how do we expose who is Munafikun and who is true. And his conclusion in chapter 9, verse 111, is this. He who is willing to fight, kill, and be killed is the true Muslim. Is that not Daulat Islamiyah's definition? Is that not why they are killing Shia, Ismaili, Nusayri, as they would call them, Ahmadiyya, and indeed any Sunni who does not agree with them? because they have the new system, and if you're not willing to fight, kill, and be killed as part of their khalifate, then you are not a true Muslim. 
You see, this is where that kind of a covenant will take you. You need a different covenant. Make hijra to Isa, my Muslim friend. Make hijra to Isa. Dr. Kashin, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have eight minutes of rebuttal from Salman. Eight minutes? Okay. Eight minutes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Kashin. Um, uh, let me respond. Uh, regarding ISIS, uh, okay, please quote me one verse, one verse from the Holy Quran or the Hadith that permit for the Muslim to kill any civilian, okay? In the Holy Quran, you read commands from Allah Almighty that command the Muslim to take care of and to feed the captive and the needy and all the people. Uh, show me one verse from the Holy Quran that commands the killing of civilians or the hadith. Um, if you go to um, www.answering-christianity.com slash ac12.htm, you'll find verse after verse uh, from the Bible, kill all the children, rip the pregnant woman's tummies open, uh, dash the children uh, uh, heads against rocks, uh, burn all plants, kill all animals, uh, take all the virgins for yourselves, kill all non-virgins, okay? And Dr. Cashin is aware of these verses very well. Mm -hmm. uh, you can visit, you can read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses uh, 20, 32, verse 37, the first book of Samuel chapter 15, verses 2 through 4, Psalm chapter 137, verses 8 through 9, Numbers chapter 31, verses 17 through 18, Hosea chapter 13, verse 16, and so many others. Again, go to www.answering-christianity.com slash ac number 12 htm and go see them for yourself. Um, ISIS does not represent Islam. You know, they kill indiscriminately everyone. Allah Almighty said, whoever saves a single life is like, he, is like saving the, all humans. And if he kills a single innocent life, it's like he killed all humans. This is a law that God sent to the people of Israel and is in the Holy Quran for us to follow. Allah Almighty gives us parables in the Holy Quran to, to, uh, to the people of uh, Israel, Noah, and, uh, and uh, sayings for Prophet Abraham and so on, others. These are sayings and, and proverbs and, and examples that we must follow for us uh, to, to be guided by. And God said in the Holy Quran, whoever kills a single soul is like he killed all people, and if whoever and whoever saves a single soul, innocent soul, is like he's saving all the people, all innocent people. Please show me, Dr. Cashin, from the Holy Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet, where a single civilian was commanded, especially from the Quran, where Allah Almighty commanded for a Muslim to kill a single civilian. I, I quoted you of many passages in the Bible, and there are tens more where you have to kill uh, children and rape uh, girls and, and kill all the non-virgins, burn all the plants, kill all the animals, kill every breathing uh, creature. That's what it says. Sounds like ISIS to me, and even worse, even. Even ISIS doesn't do that. Okay? So, uh, and uh, by the way, when Jesus Christ returns, peace and blessings be upon him, will he not put the entire earth to the sword? Will he not declare a world, a global war against all evil on earth? So what is that supposed to mean? Um, and ISIS, by the way, the, all their weapons are 100% American made. They've been fighting for four years now. Have they, not, they, they, never ran, they haven't ran out of ammunition yet. Okay, they, 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 uh, they magically uh, took over a few Iraqi military camps, right, and took all their weapons. All that supply last, is lasting till now, they never ran out of bullets and ammunition? No, the U.S. and Israel are backing them 100%. All of their weapons are 100% American made. Not even French or British or, any, or Russian or 100% American. America, just like Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, that cr who created Al-Qaeda, America, the CIA, and funded them, Al America created also in Israel ISIS, all right? It's time for all people to understand this. And all their weapons are 100% American made, and all their ammunitions are supplied by America. 
In fact, uh, there's a guy from Texas. He had a logo, a company logo on his truck. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, saw it. They put it on, on CNN. It was so ludicrous. He found his truck in Iraq. The company logo. They did not even move, remove the logo. How the hell did that truck, ma uh, SUV, made it from, from Texas to Iraq, to ISIS? How? Go Google it. So, you know, ISIS, ISIS, Dawlat al Islamiyah, all this is baloney. This is all American garbage and Israeli garbage. And the Prophet said, the one eyed Dajjal, Antichrist, will rule the earth. One eyed. Look at the back of the US dollar bill. His symbol is the eye, the, the, the Al Awar al Dajjal, the, 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 the pyramid with the eye, the all seeing eye, the eyes of Horus. Okay? That will be the symbol of the Dajjal. The Prophet said that will be his symbol and he will rule the earth. Um, why did Osama quote Paul if he's false? I quoted him as a historical, I quoted him histor as a historical, uh, his historical statement but, uh, when he referred to Hagar in Arabia. I didn't quote him as a religious authority. You can quote anybody. You, you quote the Holy Quran doesn't Two mean minutes. you believe it's uh, it's divine authority. Um, um, uh, why can't Muslim uh, earlier? Uh, Doctor Cashin said Muslims can't call themselves children of God. Yes, we can. Not children. Because again, that's all translation of translation. I am Mustafa, re uh, begotten by God. I'm Khalilullah, uh, friend of God, and Waliullah. And also, if you read uh, Abraham, also God Almighty defined what son of God means. I'll give it to you. Uh, in um, I hope I make it. Um, uh, Abraham in in, uh, in, uh, in 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 Isaiah chapter forty one verse eight and Chronicles chapter twenty verse seven and James chapter two verse twenty three. Abraham was called the friend Khalil Allah, the friend of God. That's what son of God means according to the Bible. A friend of God, a chosen one by God, and God defined in the Holy Quran chapter twenty one verse twenty six. And they say, God, the most gracious, has begun offspring. Glory to him. They are but servants raised to honor. Honor. They're honorable creations, my beloveds. They're not, there's no divine son of God. That's what God Almighty, that's what Islam refutes. There are sons of God, Ahlullah, and especially in heaven, where, where we directly talk to God Almighty. Ahlullah, people of God. But no one is the divine son of God. Divine son of God. Sharing God's glory and power. There's only one God. Jesus, Melchizedek, uh, the archangel, Gabriel, all these beings, whether created from uh, light, the angels, uh, the word, uh, or created from the word, or the spirit, all of them are from the world of command of God Almighty. We are the flesh and blood world. And we have the spirit of God blown into us. Jesus was created from the word of God. And he had the spirit of God blown into him also. This is why Jesus could not have died on the cross, my beloveds. And he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without a single drop of water and, and food. So he was mighty being. He couldn't have died on the cross for three hours. Thank, uh, you, brother. thank you. Brother Osama, thank you. Brother Keshan, you're going to get five minutes for rebuttal again. And you will get five minutes also. And if we can stay on the topic, uh, especially about the coming of the Messiah, if we mm -hmm. can. Okay. I'm trying to see, you know. All right, are we starting? Go, yes. Go right ahead and begin. Okay. Well, we, we got a little bit off track when we started talking about Messiah who brings a kingdom that is not of this world. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we got into this discussion of can we establish the political kingdom of God on earth by means of coercive violence. Uh, actually, there are many, many examples of the killing of innocent civilians, both in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Uh, in the Quran, it is found in very oblique formats. You, you can't really tell from reading the Quran itself. Like chapter 33 tells you the story where Muhammad says, some of them you killed and some of them you enslaved. This is a reference, according to Ibn Kathir, to the Jews of Banu Qureza, who Muhammad uh, uh, argued that some of their leaders uh, had uh, rebelled or were in, in the process of fomenting some kind of conspiracy against him. Uh, he then uh, besieged their cities when they surrendered to him. He didn't take the leaders alone, who might have been the ones leading a supposed conspiracy, but he took every male of that tribe who had developed pubic hair 
and they were all executed. The women were then distributed as sex slaves. Uh, many of those boys, 15, 16, 14, 13, were clearly not soldiers. They were just males. Um, a second point that you can demonstrate quite clearly from the Sunnah is, answer the question, what should be done to a Muslim male who leaves Islam? And Muhammad is very clear on this point, and I've read it in many, many different parts of it. It's not just one or two hadiths. It's all over the place. If any man leaves his religion, kill him. It doesn't say if he's a soldier or if he's in conspiracy against us. If he leaves Islam, he should be put to death. Then regarding um, the Bible, and you're right, there's a lot of really uh, horrific stuff. I mean, if you look at, uh, and I am familiar with all these passages because I have to explain this quite a bit as well. Uh, if you go into Joshua 6.21, it says, kill everything that breathes. No doubt about that. Uh, by the way, the eschatological picture that you give of Jesus slaughtering the world with a sword, well, that's really what happens in Islamic teaching as well. So we're really not different. We're in the same camp with regard to that. But what is important here is to ask the question, does Jesus teach this? Because I'm not a follower of Joshua, and I'm not a follower of Moses. And I do not believe that those things are things that anyone should obey or follow today. And I can say that bluntly. Can you say that you will not obey the adages of chapter 33 of the Quran? Is that something that should not be obeyed today? If someone conspires against Islam, should you slaughter not only that person, but their family? Is that the proper Never response? That. that would be something for you to answer for me. But one other point that, that you've said, and I think this is a point at which uh, you kind of display your problem with logic and uh, what we would call the proper rules of um, historical critical analysis. And that is that you have, at the end here, thrown at us a whole mass of urban legends and the kind of nonsense that you can find on the internet if you're looking for people who are going to tell you what you want to hear. Uh, yes, an American truck from Texas was somehow cited in, amongst uh, Daulat Islamiyah, and it's the Americans and the Jews who are supplying the money because it's all a conspiracy to destroy Islam. And I've heard this stuff. I've, I've read it. Um, all of this is engaging in what we call the blame game. In other words, it can't be our problem. It has to be somebody else's problem. Uh, it's a conspiracy. It's what the filthy Jews are doing, or it's what the Americans or the British or the colonialists or the other people. And at a very deep level, Osama, One minute. you are actually imitating the Quran. There is a beautiful story where Jesus says to his disciples, do not seek to take the speck out of your brother's eye until you've taken the log out of your own eye. I don't find this teaching anywhere in the Quran, and I find it nowhere in the Sunnah. The aspect of looking at yourself first, as Dr. Phil would put it, you cannot solve a problem that you're unwilling to acknowledge. And Islam has a problem with coercive violence. Until you acknowledge that problem, you will not be able to solve it. Dr. Keshen, we still have 12 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, Brother Osama, are you ready for yes, rebuttal? Yes, two minutes. <clears throat> Actually, five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Keshen. Um, in regards to Noble Quran, Holy Quran, Chapter 33, uh, there is nothing about killing uh, civilians, uh, and th there is nothing vague about it. Allah Almighty said, حَتَّى تَضَعُ الْأَرْضَ الْحَرْبَ أَوْزَارَهَا you fight the infidels until the war ends between you, until the war puts down its arms. Okay? And the Muslim is forbidden from, from uh, killing any soldier drops his weapon. In fact, we are commanded to feed them for the love of Allah. God said, um, Also as to uh, sex slaves and all that, um, that's... Allah Almighty commanded the Muslims to, uh, if, a, if, a, if a person wants, to, uh, uh, if a slave wants to seek his freedom, th and that's a topic I'll be more than happy to debate, then not all, if, you fee if you see good in them, not only you give them their freedom, you give them money from your own wealth to help them start their life. And uh, also, uh, and uh, uh, 
Fakkur Riqab, these are all in the Holy Quran. Uh, uh, you know, whenever a Muslim can, he must uh, free a slave and as also uh, for repentance, if I make a sin or something to, uh, to pay it back, you either give charity or you fast or something or you free a slave person. These are all Islamic commands. As to slaughter their families, I, this, I guarantee you, you will never find this in any Islamic scriptures. Not in the Quran, not in anywhere that kill them and kill their families. The Quran never said it once. In fact, the Quran, Allah Almighty said, "Wala taziru waziratun wizra ukhra." No one, let no one uh, carry the the burden of another. You can't punish somebody for someone else's sin. You will never find kill them and kill all their children and all their families. You find it in the Bible. You won't find it in Islam. And uh, as to uh, us being in the same camp. I uh, mean, maybe, but the, uh, definitely Islam prohibits, prohibits the killing of civilians. And God was, uh, Almighty said, if you, if you save one innocent life, it's like you save all the people, all the innocent people. And killing is only allowed for those who are, um, uh, for, for, for those who deserve it. Uh, now, as to uh, uh, the Jews and conspiracy and all that, this is not a conspiracy. These are facts, just like 9-11. Uh, have you seen the Pentagon uh, bombing? They say it's a jumbo jet. It's, it looks like a drone and, and eyewitnesses. I have a, a video of an eyewitness who saw an actual a small jet, he said, came down and smashed into the Pentagon. They say it's a 747 jumbo jet. It was a predator drone painted as a civilian plane, a small plane that struck the Pentagon and blew it up. This is not a conspiracy theory. These are facts, okay? Just like ISIS, it's a fact. Okay, the Zionist conspiracy, 9-11, it's a fact. These are not uh, uh, theories. The Zionists are evil. Two minutes. If you read, uh, if you Google Albert Pike, Albert Pike, Christian Muslim war, Albert Pike, he's, he lived in the 1800s, he engineered World, war one, World Wars I and two, and he said the final war is to have a war on a global scale between Christians and Muslims, fight each other, to allow, to enable the Zionists and the Illuminati's to rule the world. In order for us to rule the world, we must have these religionists collide on a large scale so that everyone will get sick and tired of religion and push for secular and Satanist societies. Google this, let's stop the ignorance, let's stop the, I'm not calling you Dr. David, uh, with all due respect to you. No, 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 I swear, I'm not, wasn't meaning you. Let's stop the ignorance, folks. Let's, let's, uh, let's at least understand what the hell is going on around us, okay? Yes, America is funding ISIS very aggressively, and so is Israel. Otherwise, they would have ran out of bullets and, and weapons a long time ago. Otherwise, uh, uh, why do you think the freedom fighters uh, the, uh, of, of Syrian freedom, uh, f uh, free army, they, were, they ran out of weapons? They couldn't defeat Assad because they were sanctioned. In Gaza, Hamas, they can't fight Israel for long. They run out of weapons. The Palestinians in Jenin, when Ariel Sharon uh, besieged it, they fought for a few days and then they ran out of weapons. I ISIS suddenly has infinite amount of weapons and they're all American made. Come on. I mean, are we really that dumb? Okay, with all due respect to everyone, ISIS is supported by Israel and by the US. They are funding this Satan, this, these gangs and thugs, okay? And by the way, they say 15,000 Westerners are, are joined, have joined ISIS. One, since one. Uh, Palestinians have been fighting Israelis forever. And the Syrians, no one joined them. Thank you, Salman. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to give each one of you two minutes before we take our break. Uh, we have two minutes for each. So I can start with you, Dr. Kashlan. You can start. All right. Thank you. Well, I would just repeat as an old gray-haired professor to my precious friend, be careful what you read on the internet. Uh, I think most people in America, if they thought that what you're saying about America and, and uh, our, our president uh, would be that, that uh, you know, uh, Barack Obama is sending weaponry to ISIS, uh, they would probably go over to that despicable gentleman by the name of Trump. Uh, I think this is a, a dream world and it's a blame game and you need to escape from it. Uh, there, uh, this is not reality, this, this is someone's ersatz uh, creation on the internet. 
Uh, and I don't want to empower people like Trump, who is despicable. But if that conspiracy theory were true, Trump would be elected president. And that's one thing I really don't want. So one minute. what are we going to say to these things? You do need to study your scriptures. Um, read Ibn Kathir in his Tafsir al-Quran. Read about chapter 33. Go through the sections, even chapter 5, which our president quoted when he made his speech in Cairo. He said, you know, if anyone kills a single innocent person, it's as if he killed the whole human race. He read the passage out of context. Read the context. It really is saying those who are Muslim and innocent, that person has killed the human race. But in the very same passage, it talks about killing other people. Study it. Look at it carefully and you'll find what I'm saying is true. This is why I really believe my Muslim friends desperately need to make hijrah to Jesus, to escape from the kingdom of God on earth established by human coercive violence. It won't work, it never has, it never will. We need a God of peace who redeems us in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Cashel. Uh, Brother Osama, you get two minutes and you can start now if you like. Thank you, Brother Cashin. Uh, the Holy Quran, folks, is very clear. I debated Dr. David Wood on this. Um, uh, killing innocents is forbidden in the Holy Quran, um, and you only allow to fight those who wage war on God Almighty. And yes, I read the context, Dr. Cashin, and yes, it talks about all people, all innocent blood is forbidden. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless it be for murder, Allah Almighty said, for murder, and you know, it's just limited to uh, Muslims or non-Muslims. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and otherwise, you know, why would God Almighty, for instance, say God never forbade you to be to do injustice uh, to uh, to do justice? Now, God never forbade you to do justice to those who live under you who don't believe in God, but who has not has, have done no harm to you. Okay, be just is closest to piety. God said that in the Holy Quran. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but God, One minute. be just, it's closest to piety. Um, we are commanded to be just with all people, not just Muslims, all people, um, non-Muslims and Muslims. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't mean that Islam is not, we're not commanded to spread Islam. Islam spread by the sword and Islam spread by the by peace and both happened those who who, uh, who fought God Almighty were put to the sword and those who uh, embraced Islam were were or of course were saved but Islam doesn't uh, doesn't command Muslims to just go and kill uh, freely uh, in fact God Almighty said do not transgress limits God does not love those who transgress only fight in the within the boundaries of war and only those who fight you um, I was going to say something. In Isaiah chapter 42, God said he will be triumphant over his enemies and he will destroy the idols. Thank you, Osama. Uh, in, uh, we are not concluding yet, but we have a conclusion coming up uh, in the next debate or the end of it. And uh, I'm hoping that everybody will stay with us. Thank you very much. You can now watch ABN in the Trinity channel on your iPhone and iPad. Search for ABN Sat in the App Store. You can watch all the following channels. The Arabic channel, the English Trinity channel, the Worship channel, the Surath channel, the Kurdish channel, the al Qadus channel, the Prayer channel, and a special channel for Europe and the Middle East. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. viewers.
You can now watch our shows on the following platforms, such as Android tablets, Android boxes, Android phones, a Chromecast stick, your smart TV, or a Roku stick. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Watch ABN on your TV. With the Chromecast stick, you can simply connect your phone to the television to watch shows. Download the ABN Sat app and click on the Chromecast button. Need help installing? Contact us at 248-416-1300. To our viewers all over the world, you can watch us by satellite through the following frequencies. For North America and Canada, please join us on the Galaxy 19 satellite frequency 11966 horizontal. For Europe and Middle East, join us on the Hotbird satellite, frequency 12111 vertical. For Australia and New Zealand, please join us on the Optus 2 satellite, frequency 12546 vertical. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. To all our viewers, you can now watch our shows on the following platforms, such as Android tablets, Android boxes, Android phones, a Chromecast stick, your smart TV, or a Roku stick. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. You can now watch ABN in the Trinity channel on your iPhone and iPad. Search for ABN Sat in the App Store. You can watch all the following channels. The Arabic channel, the English Trinity channel, the Worship channel, the Surath channel, the Kurdish channel, the al Qudus channel, the Prayer channel, and a special channel for Europe and the Middle East. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Watch ABN on your TV. With the Chromecast stick, you can simply connect your phone to the television to watch shows. Download the ABN Sat app and click on the Chromecast button. Need help installing? Contact us at viewers, you can now watch our shows on the following platforms, such as Android tablets, Android boxes, Android phones, a Chromecast stick, your smart TV, or a Roku stick. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here for a conclusion of this debate. We thank you and we would like to hear now, each person will get seven minutes each and then at the end they'll have two minutes. Uh, I want to start, Dr. Keshen, you'll be the first one to, to go and 
Seven minutes, right? Seven minutes. Okay. You ready? Yes. Go. Testament. The oldest really goes back to Genesis chapter 3, found in Malachi in the very last chapter. And then we've seen how those prophecies were fulfilled in the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic promise of a redeemer, savior, who would bring us to God. I want to finish with just a little story and uh, let that be my final word. Many years ago, I was sharing the gospel with Muslim friends in Bangladesh. And one day a man came into my office and uh, sat down on the floor next to me, looked me squarely in the eye and he said, what does Matthew 121 say? Well, I don't hear that kind of a question from a Muslim very often. So I said, why do you want to know? Well, he said, Jesus told me to ask you. What? How, how did Jesus tell you to ask me that? And he went into a story. The previous night was the night of what they call Shobe Borat in uh, Bangladesh. It's the night of fate, the night of power, uh, when people believe that if they pray all night long, uh, God will make their, uh, uh, they will give him, them a positive future for the coming year, will de determine their fate in a positive way. And uh, uh, he said, uh, I was trying to do that, but you know, there's a condition. You can't fall asleep. If you fall asleep, you don't get the barakah, you don't get the blessing. Well, his spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. And in the middle of the night, he fell asleep. And as he slept, he had a dream. And first his father came to him. Now his father uh, was predeceased. He'd been dead for six years. And so this was a very powerful moment. So he got down on his knees and he did the pronam kora. He touched his father's feet. And he asked him the question that was the most important question you could ask. And so he said, Father, Father, tell me the way of salvation. How can I know if God will accept my deeds? And the father said, I don't know, but talk to the one who comes after me. And he vanished. Then another man appeared in his dream and he recognized him even though he'd never met him. It was his grandfather. Now his grandfather died before he was born, but he had seen pictures of his grandfather. He had a bushy red beard because his beard was dyed red with henna uh, because he was a haji. He'd been on Hajj. He was the first man from their village ever to go on Hajj to Mecca. And uh, so again, he fell on his knees and touched his grandfather's feet. And he said to his grandfather, 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 tell me the way of salvation. How can I know if God will accept my deeds? And the grandfather also said, I don't know, but talk to the one who comes after me. And he vanished. Then a third man appeared in his dream and he knew immediately who he was. It was Hajat Isa Masih, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, he fell on his knees and he touched Jesus' feet and he said, Jesus, Jesus, Aisa, Aisa, tell me the way of salvation. How can I know if God will accept my deeds? And Jesus said to him, I will show you the way of salvation, but first you must go to the missionary in this town and ask him what Matthew 121 says. So he says to me, what does Matthew 121 say? He'd never seen a Bible. He had no idea what Matthew was. But we opened to the passage and I read it for him. And this is what it says. The angel speaking to Joseph says to him, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And I said, this is the answer to your question. Your works will never get you to God. But God has sent a savior for you in Jesus Christ. Jesus gave this commandment to us in Matthew 28, verses 16, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of Messiah to everyone. To the believer in Messiah, a commission. Tell everyone from every nation about what I've accomplished on the cross. And so when you come to the book of Romans, it very simply tells us how we can be saved. When asking the question, what is the way of salvation? He says a very simple thing. 
What does the word of God say? The word is near to you. It is in your heart and in your mouth. Two minutes. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And that's a term that means God. If you confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And in fact, John puts it this way in 1 John. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. That's the message of the prophecies of Jesus. God has sent a Savior. He is your Savior if you accept him. And that invitation is open to every man, woman, and child, every person of every race, of whatever religion or creed, whatever background. Only Jesus can save us from our sins, and he is the way of God's salvation. He is God's chosen one to bring us to God. And my prayer is for you that you would be blessed in this way, that you would experience God, that you would come into relationship with God for which you were made, and that you will spend entire eternity glorifying God and enjoying him forever. Thank you, Dr. Cashin. Brother Osama. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Cashin. Seven minutes. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Cashin, uh, and thank you, Brother Jacob. It was a pleasure debating you, Dr. Cashin, and I thank, again, uh, the ABN Trinity Channel for hosting this debate and for having, uh, having me and having us. It's, it was a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, in regards to the Lord Jesus being salvation, yes, he is the salvation of the people of his time and those who believe in him. Every prophet um, was throughout all of earth, uh, ha, ha, humans have received prophets, and every prophet was the salvation of his people. You know, uh, uh, geologists say that earth is 4.6 billion years old, and uh, it was very hot at then, uh, back then, and uh, as it cooled down, it took about 800 years, eight, uh, 800 million years, okay? Uh, until for for it to cool down to a point where uh, water and you know water and vegetation and lush and all that start to come up uh, uh, to form uh, in it. So um, life as we know it began on Earth around 3.6 roughly billion years ago. It had all kinds of creatures and had probably humans in it. And so th there are. Um, many, many, many uh, uh, people that existed before us. And Allah Almighty said in the Holy Quran, uh, people, uh, Qurun passed before us, and God ja'alakum uh, khala'iqa. Uh, God made us into na uh, people of, of our age today. So Adam uh, uh, was not the first human. He was our generation's first human, our humanity's first human, but there were other humanities, humans before us. The point I'm making, folks, is that Millions upon millions of years, humans had existed, and prophets were sent, and God Almighty, you know, sent salvation, uh, people to send salvation to, to all kinds of people. Every prophet was his people's salvation, and Jesus Christ was no different. Um, of course, he's the Messiah, and, and uh, the people who call him, uh, you know, bastard, son of a harlot, and all that, of course, he's innocent from that, far be it from him. Um, Though this warning is for them, okay? None of this means he's our creator. I don't know why we have to mix, you know, the, uh, the, the, the things, the praises that Jesus had uh, and the gifts that Jesus had with him being God Almighty. You know, why, I don't know why we have to make, suddenly make that connection. You know, why he has to be my creator just because he's a Messiah and he's a, a chosen one. Um, so that's that. Now, as to how does God accept my deeds, I tell you, the Holy Quran answers it. God Almighty said, "Man rabbahu salim." Those who come, the the one who comes to his God with a clean or pure heart. Okay, it's not about doing deeds. It's not about me praying. And uh, yes, of course, I have to pray and I have to do uh, pay charity and I have to sponsor orphans and I have to. Um, do good and be just and be genuine tell the truth always from my mouth don't uh, mislead people don't lie don't you know don't do this don't do that um, 
but really I have to be genuine with God Almighty. I have to be true. I can't be a show-off. I can't be fake. It's not about just deeds. It's about being, it's about the intentions, first of all, first and foremost. The intentions after, of course, faith. And yes, God Almighty does praise those who stay up late at night worshiping Him and glorifying Him. Okay? I don't know why uh, our Christian brothers take that as something um, negative, like extra works that you don't have to do. Since when? I mean, Jesus, did He not in the night of crucifixion stay all night long uh, praying to God Almighty the way Muslims do? And He commanded and He scolded His uh, disciples, telling them, Go pray to God that He may protect you from temptation. Right, Dr. Cashin? All night long. Okay, that's what we do in Islam, my brothers and sisters. Why is this supposed to mean something negative all of a sudden? That, yeah, you know, you do have too much works in Islam. No, you have to serve God Almighty. Of course, with a clean heart. You have to have a clean heart first. But you have to worship God. You have to be a slave of God. This is not an insult to... It's not a negative point. It's a plus point. And Jesus himself was a slave of God. Abdullah. I demonstrate from the Old Testament, he's abd, just like the slave, the word for slaves, the Jews, the slaves of the Jews, abd. He's a subject of God, and uh, I want to remind the uh, the folks, you know, that God Almighty, uh, 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 Jesus was a subject of God Almighty. Um, he was given authority. He never had it. In essence, in essence, he never had it. It was given to him. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, God has made him master in Christ. And Jesus, again, he didn't know when the hour will come. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, no one knows when the hour will come except God alone. Okay, no one knows. I don't know. No one knows. Only God knows. So, and uh, remember Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 3, the spirit of fearing God will be put upon this servant, this abd. You know, why would God fear himself? <laughs> I mean, how does it even work? And my, my uh, beloved and respected Dr. David, he responded to that, you know, especially on the Day of Judgment that Jesus didn't know it, that, yeah, uh, he left it to God, to, to God, to the Father. The Father knew it. But if he's God the Son, he's my creator, Jesus is my creator. One minute. Then he should know. I mean, he, he, he would know. Otherwise, Trinity falls. Why, why, why should we even have Trinity? Um, you know, God, I mean, there are seven spirits of God. Why, why does it have to be three? Why can't it be seven? The Old Testament and New Testament talk about this. I'm not saying God should be seven. God is one. But I'm just saying, I mean, why, why this trinity? You know, why can it be something else? Like, God is one, and everyone else is a subject. Even the mightiest of the beings out there, like Jesus and Melchizedek and Gabriel and others. And Satan, when he was good, before, when he was Iblis, he was a mighty being also. Then he turned bad. Um, and Melchizedek, Jesus had to be, and according to Melchizedek, that's in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, Psalm chapter 110, verse 4, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 20. Jesus had to be in according to Melchizedek, who was the Jew's highest priest, but no father, no mother, and no beginning and no end. No beginning and no end, folks. I don't know why this doesn't mean anything. Uh, thank you. Sama, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, we're going to be in conclusion with two minutes for each person and that will end our debate but let's uh, go for the two minutes uh, sure you ready uh... yes I'm quite ready all right that's, uh, that's I'd two like minutes. to take my final two minutes just to go through a passage uh, that my, my good friend Osama has mentioned uh, the passage in Colossians chapter 1 which uh, I'd like you to listen to as I read through it and recognize that this is a description of Christ and you will hear intimations to the Trinity, to other persons in the Godhead, but then the focus comes down to who is Jesus. And it's not flipping back and forth between God the Father and Jesus, God the Father and Jesus, but it's from the latter part of the text, it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. This is who he is. Listen. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. That's God doing something through Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's who Jesus is. And then he goes on to describe who this Redeemer is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
For by him all things were created, kalimatullah, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created One by minutes. him and for him. Well, this is clearly the Christ of glory, who is Lord of the universe. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. A human being doesn't hold the universe together. Only Christ does that. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Jesus, the fullness of God, just an abd. I like your name, Abdullah. I would like to have that name. But the reality is, Jesus is God and our Redeemer. Thank That's you. That's a question. Thank you. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yes. Colossians chapter 1, verses, verses 15 through 16. He is the image of the invisible God. I showed you before the image of God in, in the Bible uh, means carrying the good attributes of God, like mercy, uh, compassion, all these things, forgiveness. Uh, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn born over all creation. For by him, that's God, all things were created. The proof for this is in first book of Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 6. Yet for us there is one, but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and from, for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came. Okay, so there's God Almighty and, there is, and then there is Jesus whom God Almighty made him. The, the head the, the, the head of this kingdom as to uh, God brought us into the kingdom of Christ yes Jesus said there were many mansions in heaven and I chose one mansion for you and that 12 disciples will sit on the 12 thrones of uh, uh, of God Almighty judging the people the 12 one tribes minutes. of Israel so there are thrones there are, there are mansions and, and there's one mansion one box of course it's infinitely big for Jesus and his uh, followers just like there are mansions for other prophets that doesn't make him God. And uh, furthermore, uh, God, Jesus said, uh, God had, Jesus had no authority, and God is the grand uh, judge. That's in John chapter 8, verse 50 specifically. And uh, John chapter 5, and chapter 10, and 17, all, so on. Also, Jesus is the heir of God, of earth only. And the followers are the heirs of God. That's in John chapter 16, verses 50. 15 and 17 verse uh, and chapter 17 verse 10 and uh, Psalms chapter 37 verses 21 through 22 and and verse 29 all righteous people will inherit the lands of God and uh, and uh, all believers are the heirs of God that's Acts chapter 3 verse 25 again the mansion that that was specified for Jesus and his followers uh, brother you. Osama Abdullah we thank you thank you brother, brother David Keshen, we thank you very much, Keshen. I, uh, I want to thank everybody who was watching us. This is our second, conclude our second debate. And I want to ask you again, uh, the ABN in need at these times, I know it's a giving times, and we thank you very much for being with us, and I hope you are blessed. Thank you very much.